Good morning. Good to see each one here this morning. If you look back on the week that was, my guess is that there were certain ways in which you struggled with your identity. Uh, because we all do struggle at times with this. And it is so easy for us to get caught up in the lies of the enemy and to think that your worth is based on how well you perform. Well, we've been learning throughout this series that that's a lie. That's not really God's plan. We're trying to discover God's truth. We're trying to really discover what God says about us. And so far, we've unpacked two statements. First of all, God says you are beautiful. God says you are beautiful. And so what does that mean? That means He says that you and I were created in His image. He says That when he created people, he looked at everything and he said, it is very good. It also means that God says, you and I are fearfully and wonderfully made. We're a special creation of God. He says of Christians that we are God's handiwork. We are God's masterpiece. We are very, very special. God's workmanship. We have a unique spiritual shape that God gave to us as he saw fit so that we could use the gifts and talents that he has given to us to bring him glory. And that, that is such an amazing thing. God is the creator of beauty. And God is the one who says, you are beautiful. Now last week we unpacked this statement. God says, you are a saint. God says, you are a saint. Now, this only applies to believers, followers of Jesus, because if you study it out, you realize that the word saint means holy or holy ones, and it refers to believers in Jesus. And we said that our true identity is inseparably linked to Jesus. It's completely connected to him. And so if you have accepted what Jesus did on your behalf on the cross, what happens is you become a Christian. You are covered in the righteousness of Christ, and God calls you a saint. What we realized last week is, okay, God calls me a saint, but there are an awful lot of times when I don't feel like a saint. So what's up with that? And... and, And we have to realize that the enemy is going to do everything possible to help us not feel like a saint. He wants us to feel like a sinner rather than a saint. But God says, God says, you are a saint because I call you a saint. You are a saint because I call you a saint. We are going to struggle with sin, there's no doubt about it, but I am no longer called sinner, I am called saint because God says so. And so if you are a Christian, you should look at yourself as a saint who struggles with sin, and this is so very important, the difference here, a saint who struggles with sin because that's grace-based, that's gospel-centered, not a sinner who is striving to be a saint because that's performance-based or performance-driven Christianity. There's a huge difference between the two. And since I know that I am a saint because God calls me one, I can rest in the hope that he gives to me. I can rest in the joy that he gives to me. I can live each day with this joy even if I mess up. Because God calls me a saint. My joy isn't based in my performance. My joy is based in who I am in Christ. And I also know that as a saint, because God calls me a saint, as a saint, I can extend grace to other people in the way that I treat them. I can treat them in a different way because I realize we are all on this journey 
We are all in the process of transformation. And because God is transforming me and I have to receive his grace every single day, I should then be able to extend it to others who are also desperately in need of God's grace. Now, when I look at that and look at those two statements that we've examined so far related to our identity, they're very reassuring to me. As I look at this, I realize, wow, I am special because God says I'm special, not because I did this, not because I did that. I'm just simply special because God says that I am. Well, this morning, we're going to continue to wrestle with this question, what about me? You know, obviously, it is a struggle. Our identity continues to be a struggle, and we're going to wrestle with this question, what about me? And we're going to unpack this statement this morning. God says you are a worshiper. God says you are a worshiper. If you go back to the Garden of Eden, that's where the first people showed up. Go back to the Garden of Eden. Before sin entered into this world, you find Adam and Eve in regular fellowship with God. That's what was going on every single day. Adam and Eve had been created by God, and they were created for a relationship with God. And that's what was happening. If you go back and you look at Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, they understood that God was God and that they were subject to Him. In other words, Adam and Eve realized that God was God and they were not. And this is, this is what was going on. It was, it was paradise in the Garden of Eden. It was utopia. It was perfection. Whatever other word you want to come up with for that. And the relationship that existed between Adam and Eve and God was a relationship of love. Love for God. Adam and Eve were designed to love God supremely. But then sin entered the world. And paradise was shattered. And from that point forward, other things have been competing with that relationship with God that we were designed for. Other things have been getting in the way. Well, how does worship fit into this? Well, the dictionary defines worship in this way. Reverent love and allegiance accorded to God or something else. Here's another definition. Devotion to, attachment or affection given to God or to something else. Worship. And there's an aspect to this idea of worship, there's an aspect to worship that says we are giving this love, giving this allegiance, giving this devotion, attachment, affection, because the object of our worship is worthy of it. This is a really important part as you look at this idea of worship. Here's what we have to understand. You and I were made to worship. We were made to worship. We were created for it. Every human being worships. Every human being worships. And with the creation of Adam and Eve, as they lived in perfection in the Garden of Eden, it was a given that they would worship God. When sin entered into the world, people began placing their love, their allegiance, their devotion, their affection, all these things on other people and on other things because as human beings, we can't stop worshiping. We were made to worship. And so we are going to worship someone or something. Well, God knew God knew that the sin problem was going to infect the human race. He knew what was going to happen with Adam and Eve and every other person since Adam and Eve. And so, because God knew that the sin problem would come along, as He has now shared in His Word various commands with people, He has made it clear to us that we were designed, we were made to worship Him. And that when we are worshiping anyone or anything else, we are missing out on God's best for us. So to help us understand this, God began saying certain things to us. Let me give you a couple examples. So in the Ten Commandments, He says in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3, you, people, 
should have no other gods before me. He was saying, you need to put him first. And why was he saying that? Because he knew that's exactly what's best for us. If you jump to the New Testament, Jesus said in Matthew 22, 37 and 38, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. He's saying this is where your affection should lie. This is where your love should be. When tempted by Satan in the wilderness, Jesus said this in Luke chapter 4. Look at this verse. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. What's very interesting, if you read the narrative in Luke chapter 4 when Satan was right there tempting Jesus, he actually had the audacity, he was so bold to ask Jesus to worship Him. And that's what's going on. That's what Jesus was replying to when Satan said, hey, you should worship me. And Jesus replied by saying, no, you worship the Lord your God and you serve him only. If you jump to Revelation chapter 5, look at this verse. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 12, the angels are singing of Jesus. In a loud voice they sang, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. What's really going on there? In essence, the angels are singing out that Jesus is the only one who is worthy of our worship. They're singing it out. They're crying it out. And so you have this conflict between God and Satan. You have God who is worthy of all glory and all honor and all praise. God who is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our devotion, our love, our attachment, our allegiance, whatever word you want to use for it. And on the other hand, you have state Satan who is doing everything that he possibly can to steal God's glory and to steal the worship that is due to our Heavenly Father. And then you have us. We're in between. Here we are as people. We were created to worship God. We were created to worship the one who is worthy of all honor and glory and praise. But because of sin, Satan encourages us to worship anything else other than God. He doesn't care what we worship. Just as long as it's not the one true and living God. Because any time we worship something else or someone else, it detracts from God's glory and it brings Satan glory. Paul talks about this struggle in Romans chapter 1. I want you to take a look at this verse. Because in Romans chapter 1, Paul is talking about the sinfulness of people. He's talking about me. He's talking about you. He's talking about all of us and how sin has infected the human race apart from being in Christ. And one of the things that he says relates specifically to how we misplace worship. Look at this verse, Romans 1 and verse 25 They, who is they? That's us, people. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. In our sinful nature, this is what we do. We worship created things. We worship ourselves sometimes. We worship other things where we place our love instead of putting our full devotion, our full affection, our full attention on the one who is worthy of all glory, honor, and praise, the only one who is worthy of our worship. And so how does this relate to our identity? Let's try to tie this together. Every person, every person wants to know that we're worth something. Every one of us, we want to know that we're worth something. And so if someone else says great things about us or taken a little further, begins to worship us, or if we worship ourselves, we feel worthy, at least for a moment. 
in our humanness, we want to find our identity in things that bring us glory, things that make us look good, things that make us feel better about ourselves. Why? Because we feel like we're worth something when that happens. We want to be recognized for our accomplishments. We want to be praised for our insights. We want to be sought after for our expertise. And what happens is that we can develop a platform and use it to promote me. Me. As I said earlier, and I'm going to say it a few more times, we are by nature worshipers. By nature. But instead of worshiping the Creator, instead we worship created things. And, and, and often the created thing that we worship the most is me, ourselves. Here's the problem with that. God, being the only one who is worthy of our worship, what happens is when we then worship anything else or anyone else, including ourselves, those things cannot measure up. They cannot measure up to what we were designed for by God. And so, rather than worshiping ourselves, as I said, we're designed, God made us to worship Him, and when we worship Him, when we, when we give Him that devotion, that affection, that allegiance, all of these things, what happens is we then point people to Him, we reflect His glory, and we actually bring Him honor and glory and praise, which is what we were created to do. So here I am, here you are, we're all, every one of us, we're going to worship something, Every single one of us. And honestly, our affections can change. I mean, we can, be, we can be fully in love with this and be worshiping this. We can be fully in love with this and then worshiping this. And I mean, we can be all over the place. And yet the problem is that nothing else other than God is worthy of our worship. And so when I try to find my identity in other things, these things can't deliver. They cannot deliver. If my identity is wrapped up in the things that bring me glory, let's think about this for a minute. I just got a raise at work. Look at me. My coworkers affirm my great skills. Look at me. I just scored 22 points, won the game for the team. Look at me. I just invented a device that cures cancer. Look at me. I just recorded a number one song. Look at me. I just starred in a blockbuster movie. Look at me. Something as simple as, I just won the board game at my house. Look at me. Or, lots of people call me smart. Look at me. Or lots of people call me athletic, look at me. Or lots of people call me gifted, look at me. You fill in the blank with whatever because we all have these things. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Why? Because we want people to notice us. All kinds of things that could bring me glory, that could say I am worth something. All of those things that I just mentioned, they're short-lived. They don't last. They bring me glory for a fleeting moment, but then the glory is gone. But if, on the other hand, I find my identity in Christ, then I can recognize what it really means to be a worshiper. And I can be a part of pointing people to the only one who is truly worthy of worship. Here's the thing, and we're going to try to just it, it really unpack this in, in our few minutes remaining together. I am special, I am valuable, I am beautiful, I am all of these things because of who He is. Not because of who I am in myself. And instead of having to be in the limelight, 
I should be living in such a way that puts God in the limelight. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. And that underscores part of my identity as a worshiper of God. Let me say it another way because I think this is so very important. On my own and in my own power and strength, I do not measure up. I do not measure up. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us, I don't really need to go to the Bible to know that, that I don't measure up in my own power and my own strength, but let's just see what God has to say about this. For example, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, and what comes next? And fall short of the glory of God. Because of my sin, I fall short of God's glory. Over in Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 64, 6, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. I might think I do all kinds of good things, but God says what looks like righteousness is really not because of my sin. When Isaiah the prophet was being called by God, he had an aha moment when he recognized who God is and who he is or was and how that compares perfect, holy, righteous God, sinful, inadequate Isaiah. And I know that what I'm saying right now might sound like I'm contradicting what, we, what we're talking about in this sermon series. You are special, you are beautiful, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But stay with me for a moment because it really does make sense when we tie it all together. Here's what Isaiah says. This is Isaiah chapter 6, and this is the beginning of Isaiah's call to go into ministry. And he says this, and they were calling to one another, verse 3, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Isaiah was saying, God is worthy. Just take a look at this. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah said, God is worthy. Look at God. And then he looked at himself and he said, I am not worthy. I am not worthy. I'm a person, a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And and he looked at God. He looked at himself and he said, I don't measure up. But what's really neat as you continue looking at this passage of Scripture, in an Old Testament way, Isaiah goes on to explain how God makes him worthy. Because that's what we want. In and of ourselves, we are not worthy. We become worthy when we are in him, when we are covered by his righteousness. It's not because Isaiah was special in himself. It was because Isaiah recognized that he was nothing apart from God. And so the text goes on to say that the angels took the coals from the altar and they touched Isaiah's mouth and they said to him, this is in verse 7, your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Isaiah became a special person that God could use because he recognized that that would only happen when he saw God for who God really was perfect, holy, awesome God, and when he saw himself for who he really was, unworthy, apart from God. In my own power and in my own strength, I do not measure up. And I hate to say this, but neither do you. None of us measure up. Isaiah didn't measure up, none of us do, but when I recognize God for who he is and I surrender to him, I find worth not in myself, but in pointing people to his worth. This is so important. If I worship myself, if, if I ask others to worship me in various ways, the worship is very empty, it's very short lived because I'm not worthy in myself. 
But if I worship God, if I pour out my love, my allegiance, my devotion, my affection, my attachment, my whatever to him, then I am pointing people to the only one who is worthy of worship. When I find my identity in Christ, I am a worshiper of him. And what a privilege it is to point people to the only one who is truly worthy. But when I find my identity in myself, I am a worshiper of me, and I point people to someone who is not worthy. Not worthy. I become worthy. You become worthy because of Jesus Christ. That's why we said last week that our identity is inseparably linked to Jesus. It is inseparably linked to Jesus. Satan wants us to love other things, to love other things more than we love God. He wants us to love ourselves. He wants us to love other uh, whatever. He wants us to think that we can find our worth in ourselves and in other things, and he says, go after it. Love anything, anything at all other than the one true and living God who created us for a relationship with him. And when we follow Satan's lies, we will always come up short. We will always feel empty. We will always wonder why we're not satisfied. I mean, there are thousands of examples of it. And you've all been through it. I've been through it. When we place our identity or we love something else and we pursue after it, it always comes up short. Everything other than the one true and living God. And why is that? Because we were designed for a relationship with Him. We were designed to love Him. We were designed to find our identity only in Him and to worship Him and Him only, to love God fully. And when we do, this is what is so neat, we find that we are worth something in Him and we are actually living out the purpose that we were created for, and that is to point other people to the one who is truly worthy of all honor and glory and praise. When we do this, because this is part of finding our identity in Christ, you know what's going to happen? We'll have joy. We will have hope. We will have peace. We will have contentment. We will have purpose. All of these things. I believe this is what Paul is referring to in Romans chapter 12. Look at this verse. We've read it many times, but I want you to think of it in terms of identity and who we are in Christ. Romans 12 verse 1. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. When I take myself off the throne and I offer my body to God as a living sacrifice, that's surrender to Him, what does the text say? That's worship. That's worship. And it's pleasing to God because I'm bringing Him glory. Paul says in other places that as a Christian, I need to come to the place where I am dead to myself and I am alive to Him. And I can keep myself on the throne, I can worship myself, and I can wonder why I'm never really satisfied. Or, I can surrender to Him, I can worship Him, I can allow my body to be used as a tool to bring Him glory, and it is in that act that I find true worth and I find true value. I have no value in myself, but I have value because He has value, and I am in Him. You see the difference? It's a huge difference. I have value because God has value, and I am in Him. And this struggle with who or what we will worship has far-reaching implications way beyond ourselves. A lot of times we like to think, oh, you know what, I'll just kind of live my life, do whatever I want, and it's only hurting me. But it's not really true. It has far-reaching implications. 
Lindsay Carlson says in Identity Theft, she says this, Declaring ourselves worthy of praise and adoration makes us false advertisers. Think about that. Declaring ourselves worthy of praise and worthy of adoration makes us false advertisers, selling a counterfeit good that leads others further into darkness and further away from Christ. And so I read that and I think, well, as a Christian, I don't want to do that. And yet sometimes I do. Sometimes I do. If as Christians... We are called to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others, which I'm pretty sure when I study the Bible, it's all over the place. That's one of the things we're called to do as Christians. We are called to proclaim Christ. And so if that is is the case, then we have to make sure that we are not sabotaging this in the way that we worship and in the way that we look at our own identity. And Lindsay Carlson goes on to say, and I close with this quote from the book because I think it really just drives the point home of what we're trying to talk about. Consumed with self-glory, which at times we are. Consumed with self-glory, we will not focus on our evangelistic mission because we cannot simultaneously worship God and self. And then she goes on to say this, if we hope to rightly worship God, we lay down our own glory in favor of His. And then she asks this question, as people come and go throughout your life, what light attracts them? What are you showcasing? Are people compelled to come to see and to marvel at you? or at Christ in you. Just think about that. Are people compelled to come to see and to marvel at you, or are they compelled to come to see and to marvel at Christ in you? You're pointing people to Him. Our identity is in Christ, and God says, you are a worshiper The question is, is he the proper object of our worship? Because I believe it has far-reaching implications for eternity.